Hello and welcome everyone to the National Council of Urban Indian Health's Peer-to-Peer -peer Solutions Center, uh, focusing on health information technology, uh, cha a a o gathering of people. My name is Tiffany Stark and I am uh, one of Nakui's public health program managers and I will be your host today. Uh, we would like to thank you for volunteering your time um, to participate in today's discussion. We at Nakui appreciate your willingness to share your UIO's experiences with your HIT and EHRs. We do understand that this could be a sensitive yet very important topic, specifically during a pandemic such as this. This is a safe place and feel free to share as much as you feel comfortable sharing. There are no right or wrong answers and we know everyone's in a different place with capacity regarding their health information technology and EHRs. Uh, so this is a chance to learn from each other. Next slide. So we are very pleased that you could join us today. Your feedback is very important and will allow us to further understand your needs for uh, HIT and EHR and how to better support them. If you do have any IT difficulty during today's call, please chat directly to communications and events and Lamar can assist you further. Finally, if you could, please enter in your name, UIO or external organization, and any tribal affiliations into the chat box. That way we can get to know each other and count your attendance. And just before getting started, we would like to review a few quick uh, housekeeping items. So please, if you have video capability, enable your camera. This helps to create a more interactive environment. Also, please note that your microphones are muted, but you will have an opportunity during the um, open discussion portion um, to have your questions answered. Also, you could raise your hand at the bottom if you'd like to be called on or just unmute if there's silence and pop in. Our chat box will be monitored as well. So please feel free to drop any questions or comments throughout the presentation and we'll address them at the designated time. And also please note that this session will be recorded for educational and quality purposes your answers will not be published and the information you provide will be used to further inform our uh, programs. And also to note, um, we would very much appreciate um, any submissions for the evaluation for this session. And also to uh, take note too, for our three other future Peer-to-Peer -peer Solutions Center sessions on November 29th, February 1st and March 1st of 2023, um, if you attend our meetings uh, with those dates and send your feedback after the session, you'll be entered to um, win a exciting Nakui token of gratitude for your feedback and time. And also we would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this um, project is supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, as a part of a financial assistance award totaling $100,000 with 100% funded by CDC and HHS. The contents are, of, are those of the authors, excuse me, and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by CDC or HHS or the U.S. government. And to begin, we would like to provide a brief background on Nakui. Our organization is a national nonprofit devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. We represent 41 Title V UIOs under IHS in the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. We strive to improve the health of over 70% of the American Indian Alaska Native population that lives in urban areas supported by quality accessible healthcare centers. And so now we would like to take a look at our agenda. Um, as you could see, we um, will move into our introductions for our speaker today, and then we will transition into our open discussion um, and then wrap up with the evaluation and some upcoming Nakui events and funding opportunities. And so now I would like to pass the presentation um, on to Evie Maho, who will be providing the background on Cha'a O. Evie? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Yat e, hello. I am um, Evelina Maho, and um, I belong to the Navajo tribe. Uh, we also call ourselves Diné. So the word Cha'a O, this is where we're gathering. Um, Micah will drop 
a picture of a chaho in the chat box. So if you wish to join us in our virtual chaho, where we'll sit and gather and talk about HIT related work, um, you are welcome to do so. Um, chaho, the word really just means like a shade house, like um, sun shelter. And um, it is only, it's one of the remaining Puebloan um, structure that still exists. And it's, it's, it's a common technique used by the Pueblo and what they um, use there. And then what they typically do is build it for like a pet houses. But Navajos, however, don't use um, the earth covered roofs for these structures. Rather, we use, um, you know, leafy branches. And um, depending on different parts of Navajo Nation, because we're spread into four states, um, you know, the, the environment, what it allows, will utilize. And there's several pictures, there's some examples of it on, on the PowerPoint slide here. Um, and they vary in size. Um, and so it, it requires constant care, upkeep. And um, it's basically utilized for, um, you know, gathering to socialize, to have family meetings, to plan for upcoming ceremonies, events. Um, you know, it could be a baby laugh dinner. It could be to plan a wedding. It could be to plan ceremonies. Um, it's also utilized just to relax in um, a place to just set up a, a little bedding and just to be able to relax during the summertime, especially um, in, in, in the heat. Um, they also are typically used for cooking a lot more these days where women gather during ceremonial events or social events or celebrations where um, women come together and they'll prepare food in this area. I've actually, growing up when I was very young, it was utilized also by the men where if they went to go um, hunt or they butchered, um, this was a place also to kind of hang the meat so the meat could, um, you know, cure. The other, typically some of the smaller structures sometimes are placed right outside the Hogan door when it faces east. And under there, there are certain ceremonial things that may take place um, conducted by the men in the different societies. But we wanted to utilize Chaha'o just as a place of gathering, a virtual gathering for you all. And, and we wanted to extend a welcome to you all today and talk about HIT under our shade today, uh, under the Chaha'o. Next slide. This next slide, um, we're not going to play the YouTube video for you all, but Micah will drop a link in there for you. But there is actually YouTube that talks about what a chaho is, and um, feel free to visit that web um, YouTube site and and kind of dive, do a little deeper dive into that for for yourselves for your own educational awareness. And I will hand it back over to Tiffany. Thank you. Thanks, Evie, and thank you so much for providing that overview. Um, and now we would like to um, introduce James Spillane. Um, he is joining us as Nakui's Health Information Technology Subject Matter Expert. Uh, James is the CEO of Health IQ. He has extensive knowledge in health information technology and EHRs. He has served on several national committees, such as OIT Information Systems Advisory Committee, and faculty for IHS IPC uh, Collaborative. So at this time, I would like to hand the presentation over to James. James? Next slide, I guess. All right, so today's presentation is about policy, but particularly how it's one of the uh, powerful tools in our tool bags of change, and it's part of uh, I like to include it in the change package itself. We kind of went over a little bit of the change package uh, in the last meeting, but I'm um, going you know, to show you how you can leverage this a little bit to kind of to your advantage and to your organization's advantage. Uh, next slide. So for today, we're going to talk about policies and procedures uh, for the first half. We're going to have like a little bit of a break in between uh, where we'll answer some questions specifically about policies and procedures and then uh, 
kind of like a little bit of behavioral economics. I'll talk about that. And then we'll go into clinical applications coordinator. What does the pathway look like for somebody in your organization, uh, even agnostic to whatever EHR you're on? Uh, what does that pathway look like? What is the main role of that individual in the organization? And then what are some of the resources that you can currently go out and get out there and how to find resources? Next slide. All right, we'll start off with policies and procedures. Next slide. So first off, uh, if you guys don't have something like this, uh, you, I highly recommend that you go out and get some kind of tool uh, mainly because like back in the day, we would have different departments do policies and procedures and then we'd all come together and they would all look different. Uh, <laughs> they would, you know, they just were not standardized. So then you'd say, okay, we're going to make a template. All right, all departments use this. One of the best ways to standardize that is to get software to do this. So Policy Wizard will actually help you. If you even if you look here, um, some of these will even like walk you through like what kind of policy are you making? If you, you know, what, what it will like flow you through it uh, pretty well. All right, next slide. And then uh, you have different things that can actually not only do that, but also house it for you. So we've gone from uh, like a binder that everyone would have in their office that they would have to constantly update to this automatically, instead of being static, we now have a dynamic cloud-based solutions where we can put all of our policies and people can quickly log in and grab them and look at them. Now, me personally, I like to actually take policies and print them out uh, just because I can see them and I can quickly reference them without having to log in. Uh, that's just my own personal preference, but I would highly recommend that you guys grab a tool like this and, and use this and just to standardize it across your organization. Next slide. So now, um, so if you're creating this now, of course, you're going to have different, different. So this was actually, I think they're using uh, the, the health share or something like that. But this one is from the Kenaiti tribe. And this is an example of just their healthcare system policies. So you can see they have a couple, you know, they're, they're pretty much hitting all the healthcare things right here. They have quality management and improvement policy. They have HIPAA high tech policies built in uh, to their, their main healthcare system. But you're going to want to break it down. You're going to want to break down your policies to like what sections you have. So if you have a behavioral health section, you're going to want behavioral health. If you have like a chemical dependency uh, section, you're going to want to have chemical dependency, dentistry, et cetera. So I'll kind of show you what that looks like too. So go to the next slide. So here's behavioral health. And so they have policies related only to behavioral health, uh, physical restraining policies. I've seen policies where uh, they have to have like alerts in case there's, you know, a silent alerts, uh, how to how to interact, when to interact with silent alerts, stuff like that. Uh, next slide. And then you can see here's like kind of like your organizational policies. So you're going to have, a, you know, administrative policies, you're going to have financial policies. You know, what do you do if you get a gift? Are you supposed to accept that gift? Well, the best way to handle that is to have a policy for it. So you're really trying to get, get rid of any of the gray wishy-washy area and trying to like standardize your organization. Of, this is how we do business. And the other thing too, that a policy does for you is it takes it off the person or the, you know, the leaders and it says, no, that's not me, that's the policy. So that's, I, that's just business as usual. That's how we do things here. And you're going to kind of want to do that. You're gonna, it's not a, it takes away the uh, personal, I think they just have something against me kind of thing. And it's like, no, that's the policy. That's how we do it. All right, next slide. So here are some of the focus points to five W's. It's kind of like journalism or anything like that. When you're creating a policy, uh, you're going to, you know, who is creating it? What is the policy for? What areas and where does it affect? When does it take effect? When does, you know, and then why, why are we gonna do it? And then at the bottom of that, I would almost put any citations that you can have or use or any citing sources that you can use, try to put that on the policy too as well. So like not only that, but medical evidence backs this, you know, so, so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. So who, what, where, when, and why? Uh, a lot of people, even like when they're doing like strategic planning, they'll say things like, we wanna become more environmentally friendly. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me. That, I mean, if I take one piece of paper and put it in a recycling, it might be more uh, environmentally friendly. Now, so what you want to do is be very 
specific. You want to say, we're going to have solar panels and wind farm 60%, you know, and 40% by 2028. Uh, and we will be operating with 80% of our stuff as renewable resources. Uh, and then so-and-so is the lead point. And, you know, so there again, who, what, where, when, and why, that's the specific you want in a policy when you're creating them. Okay, next slide. So I'll kind of kind of jump into just a couple. Like, so here's one which is reporting a possible breach. And this is from Aleutian Pruloff Islands Association. So that's where you see the APIA uh, on there. And they're basically going step by step. Uh, so not, and that's why we call it policies and procedures. You have the policy, but you also have the step by step of what you're supposed to do. So the first thing you're supposed to do, hey, you got to go within 24 hours, you got to notify a supervisor. Uh, the next thing you got to do, and it just kind of goes through, and here's the office number, and here's what you do, and then it goes down how to contain it, and there's a whole bunch more, but we won't go into it. But again, very specific, and that's what I really want to key into of why we do the things the way we do it, and what happens when it happens. This is what you do. All right, I'm going. I'm following the policy. I'm following the procedure. Next slide. So. Secondly, always make sure that whatever you're doing is fitting into what your aim is, what your vision is, and what your mission is. Is it strategically aligned? I talked about that a little bit when we were talking about the change package. Everything you should be doing should be strate strategically aligned with your organization goals. You don't want to have a policy that directly violates what your mission statement is. Next slide. So now I'm gonna talk about the fun stuff, behavioral economics and policy and how we can uh, utilize that to drive change in our organizations. Next slide. So there are a lot of books out there. Daniel Pink wrote Drive, uh, Economics talks a little bit about behavioral economics. Nudge is really good. It's really good if you're in healthcare particularly, you should read it because uh, they actually talk about specific things relating to healthcare but how you can do things to actually nudge people, nudge behavior into a certain direction. And we can use policy to do the same thing. All right, next slide. So here's an, here's an example of just like a visual behavioral economic. You're nudging people to slow down. So the key word is when you're looking at the policy, what action do you want people to take? At, and pretty much what action do you want them to take intrinsically, not extrinsically? You're not forcing them to do it with the policy. What you're doing is using the policy to steer them in the right direction. Next slide. So I'm gonna give certain examples of how this has been utilized in Indian country. And that's one of the great things. I get to go all over the country and work with all these different ITUs and see, oh, that's a really good idea. And then kind of take it back and like share it with you guys. So seek, sense, and share is what I get to do. And it's really fun. So for example, HIV. So uh, APIA said, all right, well, we want to increase our HIV screening measures, just not for prenatals, but for the whole population off of CDC guidelines. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it a policy that when we draw blood, uh, we are just gonna draw for all these things every single time. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an opt out option. So you have to sign paperwork that you don't want to draw for this test, this test, or this test. And then what they did was they notified everybody in every single room, they put up postings saying, this is what we do. This is how we care for our people. These are all the dra draws that we do when we draw blood. Uh, if you don't want to do it, here's a piece of paper to opt out. Well, people are also sometimes lazy and they're like, I don't want to fill out extra paper. Yeah, yeah, whatever, do it. Uh, STDs were the same thing. I've seen policies that were typically driven to that. Uh, here at San Carlos, because diabetes is so prevalent here, one of the things that they do is the board just said, you know what, we're going to create a policy and every single person that comes in, we're going to do a blood stick on and we're going to measure their glucose. Uh, other sites, because they have certain grants uh, like that say, hey, or they're maybe certified patient center medical home, they have to go ahead and ask questions like health literacy. So they actually bake that into the policy that we're gonna ask everyone, hey, do you have trouble uh, ever reading your medications or have to have someone read them for you or, or need help with your, you know, somebody to explain the doctor's instructions to you? Uh, the other one is like grants like HRSA, which some of you might have, you can use policy to drive towards that. So specific things like we're gonna take a height and weight on every single patient. Therefore, and then we're going to do nutrition and we're going to do edu educations based on that for that grant. And then GIPRA. So next slide. So here's an example of now taking that and, and, and using it in health IT. So because it's a policy, they were able to put it into a screening bundle. And so when an MA goes in, 
they ask every single one of these questions to every single patient. So they treat it now like vitals. We're going to talk about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Have you had a fever, et cetera? Uh, just like we did during the time of COVID, uh, they, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're using, they're using their system to their advantage to capture this data and to help you know, really be patient-centered. So there's health literacy on there, if you see. Um, next slide. And then finally, you know, one of the things is, is uh, you want to bake these kind of things, like these policies and procedures, these, these improvement plans, your KPIAs, whatever you guys call them, uh, your KPIs, all that should be baked into the system. And everybody should know, oh, I'm prepping for this now. So here you have a good calendar of what, you know, quality improvement looks like in an organization. And policy would be a part of that too as well. And you can say, oh yeah, now we're, we're gonna review all the policies and then now we're gonna make new policies and then now we're gonna do new improvement plans. You can strategically align all this stuff and bake this into your healthcare system. So you have policy and improvement plans working together side by side with budgeting and stuff like that. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna pause right here. And then any questions uh, regarding policies and procedures? You guys good? You guys want me to go on? James, I have a quick question for you. My name's Heather Hoff. Um, I work for Denver Indian Health and Family Services, and we are in the process of revamping all of our policy and procedures. And um, one of the big things that we're kind of struggling with is how do we push out all of those policies and procedures to the staff to where it doesn't overwhelm them? Yeah, um, well, uh, so one of the ways we do it is on the onboarding process. So you on onboard folks, you say, here's the policy and procedures, take this home. You know, you, you start on Tuesday, but here's our policy. Please read through them and sign off on it. Uh, the other way is to do things like I showed earlier, where you have things like health stream, where you put all the policies up there. But thirdly, one of the things that we do is we really try to focus, like focus, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Uh, focus on your department that you're in. So if I was in lab, I would be focusing on the lab policies. If I was on, if I was in, you know, pharmacy, I'd be focusing on the pharmacies. And then later on, I would expand that out. So you could do it that way. Does that make sense? It does. Specifically, my piece is going to be privacy and security, which touches everyone in the facility. So for me, it's like everyone has to see all these policy and procedures I'm making. And right now, um, I mean, it, it's quite in-depth. We've got all the policies approved by our board, but with the policy comes procedure. And that's where yeah. I, I get concerned that, you know, if I push out a hundred procedures at one time, that it's going to overwhelm the facility, you know, the workers in the facility as well as other departments are then pushing out policy and procedure at the same time. So just on top of my 100, there might be, you know, for the clinical staff, another 50 that they have to read. And it can't be done at onboarding, right? Because these people are already in the facility. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if you had any insight on that. Well, I would look to, I would look at bundling them up in terms of like, these are all similar in life. Like, so we'll push those out. And then the next following week, we'll push out, you know, push out, you know, 15 more policies that are, you know, kind of alike and similar, all dealing with a certain aspect of privacy, and then maybe send out one that's on reporting and then send out one, you know, that's on that for something. I don't know. I like that. We were looking at um, purchasing a learning module so we could push them out that way. And I yeah. was thinking, you know, how many, like, how many a week can I give somebody without them going, I'm just going to say, yes, I read all this and not know what to do. Yeah, well, and one of the things you, we do here is we question folks. We just go around, like I was just joking just earlier, uh, we'll just straight up say, hey, do you, guys, do you know the policy? So just kind of incorporate it into your, what you do. So, uh, so you could just spot, you know, on the spot, talk to like an MA and be like, hey, by the way, do you know what to do in case, you know, you know we have uh, inspections a lot here with, you know, Joint Commission. So we're always doing this because we're always prepared for Joint Commission to come. I'm like, hey, did you know, are we supposed to have hair ties? Where are your hair ties? Hey, what about food on the desk? You know, are we supposed to have food on our desks, workstations? So you just kind of, just kind of always be doing it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So I think we can move on. Next slide. Oh, quick um, addition, James. Sorry. 
um, I was listening into um, all of those um, options and I totally agree. And then I was also thinking back to when I was at a practice, um, we would, you know, break it up by also having some of them incorporated into our all staffs or have like a lunch and learn too. Um, yeah. That way it's broken up and there's a little bit more engagement and it just doesn't feel like, oh, we have to talk about policies and procedures. So it yeah. makes it a little bit more inviting too with a lunch and learn. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, anything you do, try to make it fun. Always try to add a fun element. And there was just a really good comment in the comment box about have a policy calendar. Uh, so you might want to connect with that person because that was a pretty good, I, I agree with that. And that's why I was kind of showing you that strategic circle how we, we, we break it up throughout the year so we, we can literally get all the work done that needs to get done. All right, all right. So next slide. Policy calendar. Yeah, policy calendar. It's a cool word, actually. I like that. All right, we're going to talk now about clinical applications coordinators' roles and responsibilities and pathways and how what it kind of looks like in your organization. So first of all, the clinical applications coordinator is just that. It's in the name. You're taking, you're the person that is the liaison between either the vendor, whether you have like a commercial off-the-shelf product, the, you're, you're the clinical application. You, you liaison, liaise uh, with those folks and with your healthcare staff. And you also liaise between your, your providers and healthcare staff and IT. You're kind of like the connective tissue that goes together for all the clinical applications. So that's what you're in charge of. So you're kind of like, think like also a project manager. You're constantly like managing these projects and these applications as they come on. What problems do we have? All right, let's get a ticket in to the vendor. Let's get a ticket into IT, whether it's internal or external. That's the job of clinical applications coordinator. So the glue that kind of connects the health IT world to the healthcare, the healthcare system itself. Next slide. So you can learn a little bit more. I, IHS, uh, IHS.gov is actually a great site for research, uh, resources. You can just go in. I use that top right search bar all the time. So, you know, you can go up there and just search RPMS. You go up there and search clinical applications coordinator, and it'll take you directly to this page. And on this page, you have training. You have you can get patches, and if you're really handy, you can update your own patches and upgrade your own EHR locally. Uh, they have FTP sites where see, on the left-hand side, you see FTP files. You can go in and actually see templates from all around our country. So you can see some from like Gila River. You can see some from, you know, all the way up at, you know, Fort, Fort Totten or something like that, where they're saying, here's our behavioral health one. Here's our pediatric one. And they, again, these are templates that are also kind of like policies, how you do. You can use these to steer healthcare. Great, great place for resources. Next slide. And then here's kind of like their training courses. So if you are on an RPMS or RPMS EHR, they kind of have it lined out. If you wanted to become a CAC or you just wanted to learn something about it, go for the CAC basics or implementation or, or go for the CAC advanced after that. Those are the two that you really, really need. And then they break it down to like meaningful use and other things like that. I've done like the EHR for him so I can learn about medical records and management, stuff like that. Um, so it's on there. And most sites like uh, Epic, where I work for Providence and other places like that, or you go work for Kaiser, they have these kind of already baked into their website somewhere. You just got to know where to look for it, but you can get training on almost any EHR from the EHR vendor themselves. Next slide. And then this is like locally. So this is what it would look like locally. I also do something similar. So if I'm onboarding a clinical applications coordinator, or I'm a uh, if, or if I'm like, they, they hire me to like train the trainer, I will come in and I'll have something like this and I'll go through everything. Like, do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do this? So that's for a CAC. I also have it for the users. So when I train the users, I'll say, hey, do you know how to change a note title? Hey, do you know how to you know sign electronically sign your note? Hey, do you know how to e-scribe or order a lab? Uh, this is something you're going to want to have uh, also. Next slide. Also online, whatever you're looking for, whether it's Cerner or Epic or you know, NextGen or one of these other off the, commercial off-the-shelf cots, uh, 
you can go on YouTube and find a tremendous amount of information. So this is like my own personal channel that I did back in the day because as I was learning how, oh, in EHR, this is how you meet the breast cancer awareness or here's where you, you click and here's what you do. So we're going to want to look on, like use these resources. You know, YouTube University is amazing. All right, next slide. Uh, this was this is the Portland area. So Portland area has it. I know California area has it. Uh, these are just for their local EHRs that they're using. So you can find these on uh, YouTube, YouTube University. All right, next slide. And then here's here's my heavy recommend. Uh, we like, for some reason, I don't know why, but we like to keep knowledge to ourselves and not share it. Seek, sense, and share. So what I'm what you're seeing here is train the trainer. So I trained Marjean on the bottom left, and I trained uh, Marlis or Marla, who's at the slide projector, and they are now training all the department leads and stuff like that on clinical applications coordinator. So how do you create a note title? How do you do this? So they are now subsistent. They are now self-governed uh, with this information and knowledge, and they can share it throughout their system, and they're not dependent on someone like me to come in and help them. They can do it themselves now. All right, next slide. And then what you'll see is all these things in coordination, policies and procedures and adapting your health, your HIT, adapting those reminders to do health literacy and all this other stuff. All these things work together. A million little things uh, create system-wide change. And that's why we're kind of, those things we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, the things we're talking about today, use all the tools in your bag to make positive change in your organization. Next slide. And then again, uh, here's, you know, again, all those little changes add up over time. It's not one thing, it's a multiple things. Next slide. And then, you know, here, you know, here we're looking at a site who not only are the, guess what? If you're, you become more efficient and you become better at what you're doing, guess what happens to your patient satisfaction? You're able to get in and see your providers, you're happy. Guess what happens to your quality measures? Guess what, guess what happens to your product productivity? All these things work together to kind of create an H, a, you know, an IHI, what we call triple aim. Better quality, better experience, and you're a steward of those systems and the people that you work for. All right, next slide. And I think that's it. So thank you so much for having me. I love, I am so passionate about this stuff. I can talk for hours and hours, but I definitely want to hear your guys' if you have any questions out there. Uh, yeah, just throw them at me. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, we appreciate you um, providing us with the policies, procedures, and um, the CAC focus presentation. Um, so we will move into the open discussion portion of this session. Um, but first, we would like to start off with a fun activity um, of Kahoot. So this is an interactive game that will help warm up our engaging uh, discussion. Um, so the Kahoot instructions are listed on the slide, and we will provide the game code once that's pulled up. Awesome, seeing folks um, get their names all set up. 
And just to reiterate for a few folks that just joined, um, if you want to um, go to kahoo.it and then enter in the game pin at the top of the screen or use your cell phone to scan the QR code, um, but we can get started um, and we could still have folks join too, um, even though we get started with this. So awesome. All righty. So the first is just please select your facility type. Awesome, so we're able to see that we have um, outpatient and residential and outreach and referral on the line, so thank you. Now, what type of EHR does your facility use? Commercial off the shelf or RPMS? Alrighty, and we can get the responses pulled up. We need some Jeopardy music to fill the silence. Yeah, you're totally right, Johnny. So there is music. Um, we forgot to select that um, option when sharing screen. So our apologies. How do you how do you select the triangle in those? Where are you getting those images from? So this is built in with Kahoot. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So we have um, four off the shelf and one RPMS. Awesome. And next question. Quiz. All right. So, what does chao mean? Shade house, shadow, sun shelter, sunny spot, lighthouse, or cover? It's interesting when it comes through on my end, it doesn't, it only has the shape and the color. It doesn't have uh, the writing in it. Oh. It's actually a feature of Kahoot so that you are paying attention to both the screen and your communications. And then the answer key is just on your phone. So, yeah, that is smart. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. And look at that. Everybody got it right. Awesome. So it is Shade House, Shadow, Sun Shelter. Um, and now we would like to move into any questions or comments about policies and procedures. And uh, please feel free to come off mute too um, if you don't wanna just use the chat. Oh, yep, Johnny. The floor I have a is question. yours. <laughs> uh, James, you talked about uh, several policy procedures that you guys have for your, your organization. Um, so I work for Bakersfield American Health Project, and you know we have ambitions <laughs> to become uh, FQ, uh, FQHC. Uh, with that, of course, you know it's alignment of the policies and procedures. 
The challenge we have is getting identifying what policy and procedures we really need. Um, I wanted to see if you were uh, would be open enough to share a list of those policies and procedures you guys have in place. Um, a lot of organizations don't want to share their policies, which is understandable, but a list of the names gets us in the right direction, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. I I get to you know I get to travel around, all around the country, uh, and I always try to I always ask like, hey, can you share your policies and procedures with me because we're literally helping other ITUs. If you share it, you, you know, you're, you're helping other folks who don't yeah. have these. So I have like thumb drives of policies and procedures and I can send some, I don't know if I've sent them to you yet, Tiffany, but I can send policy and procedures out. Like those ones that you just saw, uh, you know, that table of contents you just saw, I have all those that we can send out to you. And then the other thing I can do is look at folks that are, you know, federally qualified health centers and, and see if I can grab, find some of those policies and share those with you as well. Yeah, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. If you don't mind um, sending them over, if you don't mind sharing, that'd be great. I, I, uh, yeah. Often, you know, the URLs will be like, yeah, we'll send them over and I never get anything. So I'm like, uh, well, maybe their boss told them no and I don't want to, I don't want to bug, you know, and push. So, but I also all get busy. So, you know, I don't really know the reason behind just an assumption, but no, that would be great. Um, it's definitely a lot of work putting a policy procedure together. Um, the biggest challenge is, you know, identifying what you need uh, versus, you know, what you don't already have. So uh, that's been our biggest uh, issue we have. Yeah. No, Thank it's you. it's like why reinvent the wheel? And and literally, honestly, I all the ITUs in the country, we all have very limited resources. So we, we are almost forced to share with each other. If somebody learns something over here, they got to share it with everybody else. I mean, that's just the way we got to roll. Yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate that. And like I said, we don't reinvent the wheel. It saves time, saves headache. And uh, even when we compare against policies we already have in places versus what somebody else has, sometimes there's uh, additional verbiage that could be beneficial to use. And it's like, well, why are they putting it that way instead of this way? Like, what's the difference? And, you know, there's opportunity. There's always opportunity improvement. So uh, we always take that into consideration, too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. And then we do have another question um, from Danita. Um, do you have any COVID-19 policies and procedures to share? Yeah, I can get COVID-19 policies. I just had, we just had one, uh, I just had one that was really cool that just came out and it was regarding not, no longer wearing a mask. Uh, so I literally just like took a snapshot of it. It's posted all over the place. Uh, and it was basically the policy and procedure of, hey, you, you can uh, you put a mask on if you have any symptoms, but we are no longer. And if we have 10 positives within a week, we will go back to putting masks on. So yeah, I can share policies specifically related to COVID-19. Awesome, thank you. That's a good policy to see, by the way, because that means we're kind <laughs> of- What state? Out of, huh? uh, I'm sorry, what state is that? Uh, was that where they no longer require the mask? Because uh, California uh, well, still requires it, it for healthcare. Yeah, this is Arizona, but this is also mm -hmm. a tribe, so they're sovereign and they can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, we'll Lucky. do what we want. Kind of <laughs> Nobody tells us what to do. So, uh, sure. yeah. yeah. It was just a guidance that came out from CDC, and then every state has theirs on top of that. Yep, yeah. exactly. I, I keep watching this, the California one. Um, I just looked at it right now when you brought that up. I'm like, is that California? <laughs> I was like, nope, still required. Like, dang it. <laughs> I, I hate the masking. Um, it's uh, it's definitely you know a, a hassle, you know, but it is an added barrier for people's protection. We used to do mandatory testing, but we stopped the mandated testing. Um, yeah. Last month, I believe we stopped it, and we only require it for those that aren't fully vaccinated. Yeah, I've seen places do mandatory testing and employees refused it and they 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 separated uh so yeah, yeah policies are they're they're a powerful force yeah for us it was the, the numbers and it was you know keep everybody safe the pandemic was newer at the time so we implemented it and then um as everything kind of just kind of dropped some because we'd watch it everything would drop down they open back up everything would pick up again so this time when they did it the numbers didn't shoot up like they did before so we're like okay we can transition away from it but if they're symptomatic and such we still follow the same process for it though just we just don't require the monthly testing because i mean ideally yeah. the monthly test would give everybody safe but you're testing if they have symptoms anyway so it's kind of being redundant to itself though you know yeah we're the we're healthcare we're the first ones to put them on we're going to be the last ones to take them off definitely definitely <laughs> Tiffany, would it be a chance you guys could just uh, create like a SharePoint uh, for a repository for all this stuff and just send us all links to that SharePoint? Yeah, that's um, a good point to bring up. 
We are um, working on having um, NTAP, which is uh, Nakui's technical assistance portal, um, which that will house all these templates for different projects um, to help our uh, UIOs. And then also there's gonna be like a discussion board component to it too. So you have that peer to peer communication as well. Um, so that is definitely in the works. Um, once we have that finalized, we will definitely get that out um, for everyone to utilize for sure. And I know I posted that question. I don't know if you, know, you saw that or not. But has anybody heard any scuttlebutt about where IHS is going? I heard at one point Cerner, but then VA is having problems with their Cerner launch. So that's kind of put the, the brakes on things. And now I'm hearing they're looking at Epic. So. Yeah, well, even the people who do know, they they have uh, well, they they signed a non disclosure, to, so they can't say anything. So, they should just give us money and let us go with whatever we decide to. But that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a lot. What, yeah, that's actually what will happen with a lot of the tribes. It's called secretaries amount. So whatever money that they utilize. Uh, for their EHR per capita of people, they can actually say, the, the tribes in the nation can actually say, hey, well, we want that same amount of money per capita uh, for us. Urbans are a little bit different. You kind of got to go with go with the flow a lot. So what are the feds doing? All right, we're doing that. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's the part of, that uh, can be a pain is like we had a transition. We're forced to transition because, you know, our payments been archaic system, then promising a the system, didn't do anything, and then they're going to come out with the system. Potentially, it's not the one that you're going to have. And then they may just say, we're not going to give you anything for it. You already figured it out. It's, yeah. it's kind of jacked up. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I did see a comment from um, Evie. She put that September 23rd, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released interim infection prevention and control recommendations for healthcare personnel during the coronavirus 2019 pandemic. Alrighty. Um, so now we will transition to any questions or comments um, for clinical application coordinators. I think a lot of us just wish that was the only hat we had to wear. Yeah, uh, especially like with uh, urbans, it's like you got to wear you're the director, the executive director, the health director, the CAC, the pharmacist, the lab tech, the front desk. I just have a question for the group. Are any of you using eClinical Works? We're using Entergy, uh, Greenway. And we're on Greenway too, Johnny. Um, Joe, did you capitalize on the opportunity for the electronic case reporting um, with uh, Nikui? I don't think so, no. It's a pretty neat grant. It's basically for us, it's paying for the integration for electronic case reporting for the mandated uh, reports for uh, certain um, infections, such as you know, someone tests positive or something, you're mandated to report to the state, federal, county, whatever. Um, the system will do it all for you. Greenway doesn't currently offer it, but they're building it. Um, so maybe a good uh, a grant funding opportunity for you um, to apply for when it opens up again um, for your organization to pay for that implementation with Greenway. Yes, thank you, Johnny. And we will um, mention that at the end of this presentation too, um, to have that link um, for the application um, since that is open for a year too. And yeah, also, another, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say another d differentiating thing for sites, and I see this a lot uh, uh, as an issue where IT thinks they own clinical applications. The reality is, is you, clinical applications is driven by the CAC. The IT is really for telephony, like your telephone systems and your networking. That's really what they're, that's their, you know, the server and all that stuff, the telephony in your organization, uh, how, who's got what, the equipment. But the application 
applications themselves are owned and project managed by the clinical applications coordinator. So you might get a little of that gray area in your organizations. I, I just wanted to be clear with that. So we, we don't have an IT person, um, really. We, we, have, we do have a, a CAC. Um, so I sit in as the IT person myself. So the way I do it with um, our CAC, Diana, unfortunately, it looks like she didn't make it on the call, but um, she does Greenway. She manages it. I support her. Um, it's like, what do you need? You're having issues with it. You can't access the remote. Um, I've given her some credentials so she can access and install programs as needed to upgrade the HR system. Um, outside of that, like she doesn't have access to the server room. She doesn't have access to other systems yeah. that she doesn't need to, but I work together with her. So my job, though, I tell her is to support her um, to keep the yep. HR system up and going and that when changes are made, upgrades are made, we need to be in communication with each other just to ensure that we don't interrupt the operations of uh, either the HR system or the network itself. Perfect. So, That's good. That's role, the good role. Those are some good roles and responsibilities. I like that. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, the IT part, it can be a lot, though, especially when someone's not designated to it, though, but um, yeah, it's uh, definitely a struggle we have as an organization and expensive because so, of the contract. Did they uh, get you access to Insights yet? Uh, Insights? Yeah. I have no idea what that is. That's the new reporting engine they're playing with right now. Really? That, that our CAC might have access to it. Um, like I said, she does all that stuff. She tells me, honestly, I really don't pay attention too much. It's like, just tell me what you need from me. <laughs> I, um, you know, I have a lot of roles on my plate as it is to keeping up with everything. So um, basically, if I don't need to get involved, I don't get involved. Um, um, I try to play a more supportive role. You know, what do you need to do? What tools do you need to do your job? And let me help you do it. Um, but I'll, I can ask her about it, though, to see if she has it. Uh, she works with uh, Anthony a lot. And uh, what's his name? Dosh, I think. Um, Game, but, but Anthony's great. <laughs> yeah, Anthony will know me well. I've poked holes in their systems and shown him uh, issues they have. Yeah, yeah if you drop, if you drop my name, he'll remember me. He's a, he's a great guy. <laughs> Before we hired Diana, I was working with them. So uh, I was in the implementation for it. And then when we hired Diana, Diana got brought up to speed. And, you know, when she was ready, I just completely let go. I think they brought me in on this uh, inside things because I poked a lot of holes in their practice analytics uh, reporting because frankly it's 20 year old technology at best well it's not even their pro program for what i understand they, they use a uh, mic pop for that so, so all that like all that's a contract and salesforce.com rebranded yeah literally they, they sold this though so we signed a contract so we got stuck with them <laughs> plus they were more affordable um cerner is a lot more expensive epic is uh we were looking at epic and we really liked epic because if, if it's um the interface it had is very customizable um but yeah. it was also really expensive and not affordable for what we can afford uh we were actually purchased uh, the funding with COVID funding and that was what we tied it to so we got lucky in a sense that COVID happened as an organization I mean, as bad as it was for our organization, it, um, it gave us tremendous uh, growth opportunity because we reinvested into the infrastructure organization. Because as an organization, you know, we were probably archaic <laughs> in our technology. So we, uh, we had to upgrade just to keep up with everything. And um, the energy system is one of the items we were ever purchased from it. Yeah, Epic is actually based off of our, it's based off of RPMS, which is based off of the VA, uh, Vista, right. and Judy, one of the color. The lady, Judy, was one of the original programmers at the VA, and she's like, wait a second, uh, this is paid for with taxpayer dollars, so it's public domain, correct? And they're like, yeah. And so she's like, okay, and she started Epic. So Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so a lot of people who come from REHR kind of like that custom, you know, how you can customize it, so. Yeah, they uh, our CEO comes from Tully River, and they use, um, they use, um, he is an epic up there, so, and then they yeah. had a CAC up there was a that was a customized interface. Uh, Entergy isn't that customizable; it's limited. Yeah. Um, you can customize some fields, but it has limited functionality. Uh, but of course, when you're going through the sales process, you know they promise more than what they're able to deliver. And um, as Joe stated, with the practice analytics, that's the reporting program that's run. Um, ours has an issue; needs an update. We don't know how to update it. They never told us. I think we have to pay them to update it. I don't know. She's hey, our tax you, you just got to request the update to it. Do they charge you for it? No. Oh, awesome. Perfect. That, that's good to know. Um, kind of pain you yeah. have to go through the website uh, to make the request for the update, but update practice analytics first and then ask for the update for energy. 
Oh, awesome. Thank you for letting me know. We, we have been updating energy. I think it's like 12.53 or something like that was the last one. So something interesting that happened is our, our EHR soft system went down, but it was kind of randomly going down for everybody. And we were like, man, are we under attack? You know what I mean? It is one of those things where you get locked out of the system, you know? So we're kind of, I'm kind of panicking, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. I call, we have a third party IT committee contract with them. Like, hey, this is what's going on. I need somebody on this now. Like, I don't know if we're going to attack, you know, we're going to have a lockout, you know, all these businesses get locked out eventually. Well, it happens to them. Exactly so how, They had an outage, actually. It was just like a month and a half ago. No, no, this wasn't, this wasn't that though. Um, what it was is uh, probably like two, three months, probably longer than that, probably three or four months ago, our uh, IT company we contract with, we, we get our antivirus from them. They have a commercial license for the AV and uh, they have a client that they install that uh, pushes out the updates for it. So they transitioned as antivirus was working great. Then all of a sudden things went crazy. Um, our, our watch guard, uh, we use a watch guard for a hardware firewall. And for one, it was, it was blocking email. So we had that issue going on. Like Kui wasn't able to email us. You know, we're getting calls from the Kui saying, hey, where are you guys at? You guys aren't responding to us. They thought we were ignoring them. Uh, other places too, like I sent you that email. I'm like, I didn't get anything. What are you talking about? You know, and um, it turns out the firewall was capturing these emails. So we resolved that issue. And then after resolve it, we started experiencing other issues. And it'd be kind of intermittent. And then until the EHR system started going down, we then found out that then the antivirus, um, after everything started coming through, started quarantining stuff. So this new uh, update from Entrogy, it thought it was um, it was a malicious script and it started blocking it and quarantining it. So it was quarantining our EHR software from being able to be utilized. And uh, so I, I had our IT company fix it once we figured it out, but they had to allow exclusions to the firewall, to the antivirus, and then they had to, then we had to reinstall everything um which which was a pain because it was each system couldn't do the update because files were missing from it so every system we had to go to put the flash drive into it and then reload it into there though and reinstall it so first we're just re uh, i'm sorry are you self hosting yes okay yeah well, it was cheap it was cheaper <laughs> more uh -huh. money for the startup it was cheaper <laughs> But it was a, uh, but that was the issue. Our antivirus was was basically crashing everything, so we had to spend you know tons of time trying to figure it out. And then, you know, we got a big bill from our IT company, which I disputed, and it was like they they went ahead and gave us credit for, it, which is like twelve hundred bucks. We got credit for it, but that just shows how much work they had to do. Um, but it doesn't cover the downtime we had here and the you know uh, the effect they had on the organization. But uh, it was myself and the CAC working together closely to try to figure out what's going on and. You know, try to narrow it down what it was with an IT company trying to figure it out too. Um, and hey, that's Johnny, when we figured it out. Do you have an SLA with that IT company? Uh, uh, sorry, an SLA? I'm not sure what, the, what you mean. service level agreement? Yes, yes. And so, so that's why I'm covering you it. you hold their feet to the fire in that service level agreement. So if things like this were, it's their fault because they're the ones monitoring and managing your firewall and your uh, antivirus, any downtime that you guys had is on them. Yeah, you, that's one thing about COTS is you really got to, you, you got to hold them to, the, you got to, yeah, you got to okay. loop back around and kind of say, hey, this is not the contract that we signed with you, you know. Okay, no, that's interesting. I didn't know that part, the little reimburse that part. Um, I did have them take, because what they did is when they submitted it as a ticket and a billable expense, so then I disputed those charges, because I'm like, this should be tied to our, our service contract with you guys. And uh, it took a few days for them to get back to us, but they researched it and like, yeah, they gave us credit for it. Um, but I didn't think about the uh, about the salary for the employees for our time expense on it, too. Um, Not only that, the income personal. you guys may have lost from uh, any uh, charges you may have done on encounters in that time period you were down. The thing is, we're not prudential yet, so we can't really count that quite yet. <laughs> right, oh, sorry, it looks like some everyone. of us are going to have to jump off here pretty quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I know this is a discussion has been going really great. I love the collaboration, um, but we are at time. Um, so for those of you that do have to jump off, um, thank you so much for attending our Chaho. Um, and thank you to Evie and James um, for yeah. presenting today. Um, we honor. really appreciate you both um, and everyone who had, um, you know, some discussion. Um, we appreciate you as well. If you do have a couple minutes to stay on to hear about the upcoming events and funding opportunities, um, I'll hang on for a couple more minutes and go over those. But if you have to jump off, thank you again and see you next time. But we can skip to the upcoming um, events and funding opportunities. Um, so we do have the next peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, solution center on November 29th. So save the date for that. 
The official invite will be coming out shortly from communications. Um, we also have our community of learning series. Um, so the dates for that are November 10th, December 14th, and January 11th. And then for funding opportunities, um, as uh, Johnny had kindly mentioned, we do have the electronic case reporting uh, year two um, subgrant award. So we have that um, open for three OIOs to be awarded up to 84,600 each. Um, and the applications are open for that for year two. Um, so we will drop in the jot form link for that. And it also will be included in the uh, follow-up email for today's event as well. And then another funding opportunity that we have is emergency preparedness and vaccination planning storyteller application. Um, so 10 UIOs will be awarded up to 30,000 each. Um, and there is an info session scheduled for November 2nd. Um, and applications are open as well. And thank you again. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. See you next time.